All right, let's get started. So today we're gonna talk about the very last, um, or start the very last unit on several things, clustering, k-means, non-negative matrix factorization, and expectation maximization, also Gaussian mixture models. So there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Okay, so we'll start at the beginning with clustering, uh, which is a new task. We've talked about regression, classification, dimensionality reduction, and now clustering is something new. So <clears throat> the idea is that you're given a data set. These are just going to be feature vectors, no targets, no labels. And your objective is to partition this data set into k different groups where samples are similar within a group and different across groups. So <clears throat> to give you a two-dimensional example, let's say you're given this, but you are not given any colors, so ignore the colors here. And so just given those samples, if you were asked to cluster them, that would you would probably say, well, these seem to be clustered together, these seem to be clustered together, and so on. And so you would come up with an assignment. You'd say, let's call these cluster zero, cluster one, and so on. And so in doing that, you're trying to find, um, you're trying to partition this into different groups. Samples are similar within a group and different across groups. So in doing that, you're sort of saying, well, these are similar in the sense that they're all close close by each other or, you know, it's, it's actually a little bit difficult in some cases to, to define exactly what you mean by clustering. So there's actually many different definitions, um, different criteria that you can use. So when we come, like, let's say to this example, you can see that it's a little bit more challenging because um, certain samples, like the distance between a sample here and here is shorter than the distance between these two samples that are in the same cluster, right? So it's not just about how close samples are to each other. There's other notions, um, maybe like that these are somehow all connected and these are all connected and so on. So clustering is a, is a challenging problem and these are just two dimensional toy examples. Problem gets a lot more interesting in higher dimensions. <clears throat> um, but does the overall objective seem pretty, okay, it's making sense, okay. So that's, that's what clustering is, and probably the most famous approach to clustering is the k-means uh, algorithm or the k-means approach. <clears throat> so the idea here is that you want to you, you, um, declare a cost. It's an RSS-based cost, but it's a little different than what we've seen before. So this is the cost. <clears throat> So here are the samples from our data set. And these are what are called centroids. And these centroids are what we're going to design. So we want to find a set of k centroids so that um, <clears throat> the sum squared distance from each sample to its closest centroid is minimized. So that's the idea. So, for example, in this picture, the centroids are the pluses, and they have been designed, you know, they, they've been, through some design process, they've been placed there. And for that particular selection of centroids, you can define the RSS cost as follows. So, if you look at all the samples in this region, they are all closest to this centroid whereas the samples in this region are closest to this centroid. So if you're looking to compute the cost according to that set of centroids, you'd be measuring the, these distances and summing all those together, and then you'd be summing all of these distances and so on. So that's, that's one way to think about it. So it's like for every sample xi to figure out how much cost it's contributing, you have to do this optimization where you have to say, well, which centroid is it closest to? Once I know that centroid, I can compute the distance, and then I can, you know, add that to the overall cost. So, um, <clears throat> is that making sense, that definition? 
All right, so, um, so if we talk about the, or define the kth cluster as a set of samples in our training set that are closest to centroid CK, <clears throat> so like all these guys would be in one cluster, all of these would be in another cluster, and so on. Then we can assign a label to all those samples, we'll call it kappa hat, by basically finding the K, the, the, the index of the, of the centroid that's closest to Xi. So, so essentially, like in this problem, once we found the K, we, we're actually more interested in the value of the norm. And here, we're actually interested in the value of K. We want to know which K was closest, and that's what we're going to report. So for all these purple samples, this is the closest centroid, and whatever index we labeled that centroid with, maybe it was one, we would report one for those samples. And then for these samples, they're closest to this guy, so all of those samples would, would receive a different label for this. <clears throat> and we call these, these, these are decision regions similar to what we saw in classification. These are Voronoi cells. Um, and maybe one way to think about clustering is, is, is to automatically label a data set. Somebody gives you a data set features without any labels, and your task is to figure out good labels for all the points there. Okay. Um, and you can actually use this in many different ways. Um, one way that it's been shown to help is if, um, is if somebody gives you a label data set, um, sometimes you can, by at the, same, at the same time you're doing your regular supervised classification, you're also doing this, you can actually improve the performance of your classifier. You're giving it like um, a different task that's kind of, you know, similar but a little different and, and you can actually get even better performance for classification. So that's one of the ways it's been used lately. Um, but there's many, many other applications of clustering and we'll talk about some other ones. Well, so, so we have a cost function. Um, I mean, okay, m maybe I, I'm not answering your question. So what, if, if you know what your centroids are, then the region is just the set of all x, set of all these x, such that um, you're closest to that centroid. So if I ask, what are the set of all the x's in the plane that are closest to this? You can see like there's going to be sort of a decision boundary here between those two, right? So, so all the points over here are going to be closer to this. But then there's another decision boundary, right? So it's like I would take the intersection, and then I notice, oh, there's this other one. So there's another decision boundary. So finally, the, this Voronoi cell that's associated with, with that is all the X's in that region. Yeah. So that is what you're learning where to put the centroids? Yes, you're learning where to put the centroids. So what we have here is we have a cost in terms of the centroids, and the next thing is to say how do we minimize this cost. Um, there's definitely other ways to do clustering, and this is just, this is how K-means does it. It's a very particular way to do clustering based on finding centroids that minimize this cost. <clears throat> we'll see a totally different way uh, later. Okay, so, um, so the, there's an algorithm that um, is commonly used with k-means. It's called Loy's algorithm. And that's what you use to approximately minimize this cost. So unfortunately, exactly minimizing this is really difficult. Um, there's no way to do that. Um, but this algorithm works pretty well as a way of approximately minimizing it. So this is how it goes. It's a, an algorithm that's simple and then it only has two steps that you iterate. <clears throat> and in the first step, so you, you start with some initialization of the centroids. Then in the first step, um, you look at the data within each Voronoi cell. So since I know the centroids, I can define some Voronoi cells. And I look at the sample mean of the data, we'll call it mu k, within the kth Voronoi cell. So I do that for all my Voronoi cells. 
And then um, next step, I set my new centroid at the sample mean, and I repeat. So let's see how this goes, this example. So let's say that somehow we initialized here. So the ver very first step is to um, compute the sample mean of the data within each Voronoi cell. So first I have to say, well, what are my Voronoi cells? So since I only have two clusters or two centroids, I basically have like a decision region here. Anything over here is corresponding to the blue uh, centroid, anything over here red. So that's what's being shown with that boundary. So now that I know that, I can label my points according to which cell that they're in. So these are all the blue points now. These are all the red points. So the next thing I do is I compute the sample mean of the blue points. And the sample mean of the blue points is approximately here. The sample mean of the red points is approximately here. Now that I have my new centroids, I, I basically start over. Now I find the Voronoi uh, regions for my new centroids. Is basically this, so anything to this side is going to be blue, anything to this side is going to be red, and as you can see, I changed the colors of the samples to reflect this new labeling, and then I compute the um, sample mean of the blue ones, which ends up being here, the sample mean of the red ones, which ends up being here, and now I, I repeat again. So now these two guys define, they, have a, they make a decision boundary, now I can recolor my points based on blue here, red here. And you can see as we do this, um, you know, there's less and less change to the centroids. Um, we're just basically at this point deciding how to deal with these points of the boundary. And eventually, um, what happens is things stop changing and you're done. Or you can terminate early if you prefer, if this goes on for too long. And so finally, you get the centroids, and those two centroids determine a set of samples that are closer to that one, and another set that's closer to that one. Actually, it's probably think about it that way. Okay, so that's the algorithm. It's not perfect. Uh, it can get stuck in local minima. Um, <clears throat> so the main way to deal with this is to initialize carefully. So there's a famous approach called k-means++, plus plus, which uh, I won't get into any details, but it comes up with a very specific initialization uh, that can give you some guarantees of the, um, the k-means cost function, and it works pretty well in practice. So this is what's used in scikit-learn's cluster.k-means by default. Another trick that you can use is you can use a number of initializations. Like you do this 10 times, 10 different initializations. Even the k-means plus plus is random. Um, so you do this 10 times with 10 different initializations, and then you, you see the, the cost that you got with all 10, and you just choose the one that gives the lowest cost. So that's another way of um, escaping some of these getting trapped. <clears throat> OK. So, um, so that's the approach. That's all I'm going to say about k-means. It's, uh, like I said, very famous, very widely used. Um, so we'll get a chance to test it out on a document clustering problem. So let's now talk about document clustering. <clears throat> so in this application, we have a huge corpus or a huge collection of documents. Um, and the question is, how do we organize them? So like, let's say these documents have not been labeled. We don't know anything about them. We just know the words in each document. So again, clustering means grouping into similar categories. Um, so here's our original uncategorized documents. And somehow we have come up with some categorization so that these guys are all sort of similar to each other and different from these guys that are all similar to each other and different from these guys that are all similar to each other. So that's our objective. <clears throat> this is an example of what people call text mining or natural language processing, which is also, you know, um, another example of natural language processing, which is very much in the media these days, is uh, ChatGPT and so on. So we're going to learn a little bit about how to deal with um, how to deal with you know text and, and language and so on. So <clears throat> for our experiments, we're going to use a data set that is based on Usenet newsgroup articles. So Usenet is a very old online discussion forum. 
Um, started on university networks in the late 70s, so we're talking really the very beginning of internet, or actually pre-internet, and they, were, they migrated to the internet and their use peaked in the 90s. And um, so this is a, just a you know, pretty small data set, it's pretty easily managed, um, so that's why we're using it. Um, the documents, as we'll see, they're, they're pretty simple and they look like emails, basically. Um, and in this, in this data set, this is, there's like all these different discussion forums, and each forum, we'll call it a category, you know, had people posting messages, responding to messages, and we know which forum these documents came from. So we do have labels. We're going to use that as sort of a ground truth, and we're going to try to see if we, without knowing those labels, can automatically create them by clustering the documents, and hopefully... You know, if we cluster them right, there would be a good correspondence between the true labels and um, the clustering we come up with. Okay, so a little bit more about this. Um, the data set is the 20 news groups data set. So there's basically 20 Usenet categories or forums. Um, this is what they are here. So you can see there's a number of them that have to do with computers, computer graphics, computer operating systems, computer systems, computer windows. Then there's like miscellaneous for sale, then various recreational ones, autos, motorcycles, sports, politics, science, and then some other stuff like religion, atheism, and so on. So this data set is available on SKLearn. Um, there's about 1,000 documents in each category, and there's 20, 20 categories. Um, but we're only going to use four categories. And in particular, we are going to use <clears throat> Alt Atheism, Computer Graphics, Psy.Space, and Talk Religion Miss. And um, when we load those four, we're going to have 3387 total samples. And each sample is like one post. So when you look at these four categories, do you think we're going to be successful in clustering them? What do you think? Yeah, so those two probably have trouble with, but maybe the other ones will be able to tell apart. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the, the way that the data is formatted is there's a dataset.data, which is an array of posts, which are strings. There's a dataset.labels, which is an array of class labels. Those are like the numbers of the categories they're coming from. And then target names, which is just the title of each category. So, um, so this is an example of how we could load and print out a particular post. So this is just like document index number 10 in our data set. We extract this, we print it, and um, this is coming from computer graphics. And this is the post itself right here. And as you can see, it looks like a little email. Somebody's looking for help with a graphics card, and, um, and that's it. So pretty short. Um, <clears throat> so some of them are longer, but yeah, this is this is mostly you know this is representative of, of what they are. Any questions? Okay. So what we have to do first <clears throat> is we have to somehow encode these text strings into numerical features so that we can use them with k-means or any other approach because everything. You know, we, we build is based on numbers, not, not strings. So, um, so to do that, um, we'll first talk about the bag of words model, which is a simple but powerful model that's, that's used quite a bit. So <clears throat> it goes like this. You have a whole corpus of documents, right, many, many documents. You go through all your documents and you list all the words. And they, in this, in this uh, literature, they call the words terms. So basically, it's like building a dictionary of terms from all these documents. You just list them all, usually in alphabetical order. So for example, um, <clears throat> this is a super simple example where we only have two documents. We look through all the terms, and we make a list of them, which are those. Now the way that you represent the, each document is just as a vector of word counts. So in the case of these two documents, now that we have our dictionary of terms, 
for document one, we would just um, write how many terms the word aid, how many times the word aid appeared in document one. Turned out it never appeared, so it gets a zero. And then we look at the word back, it appeared once, so it gets a one. In this particular case, there's no word that appears more than once, but if, you know, if I added, um, I don't know, if I added, let's say, the word aid again to here, then that would appear twice and I would have a two there. Okay, so, so basically, now the document is just going to be represented by this vector of numbers. That's how, I, that's how we do this in the bag of words model. Oh, and by the way, we also omit uh, very common words like the. There's a list of stop words, so every language tends to have a list of stop words, official list of stop words, stuff you just leave out of this bag of words model. Um, so what do you think, what's your reaction to this model? What have we lost in doing this? Like the structure and the sentences. Yeah, Cause, because now we have no idea which word came before another word, right? It's just, we're just like a count of how many times it was used. So a lot of meaning has been thrown out the window in doing this, okay? So it's definitely not the most powerful thing, and you know, Methods like ChatGPT are doing something much more sophisticated where they're definitely looking at the sequence of words. Uh, bag of words model does not do that. It throws out every notion of you know, sequential data. It just, it's just like a, literally a bag of words, like how, you know, how many times did this appear? So that's all we're working with. Definitely we've thrown out a lot, but still, it turns out that this is still very widely used. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, so there are a few other challenges. So one challenge is that sometimes you have one document that's a lot longer than another. So if that was the case, you would notice that it has a, a count, you know, that has many more um, words than other ones. So, so that means there's going to be sort of an imbalance um, across documents. Another issue is an imbalance across words or terms because some terms are used very Often, and other terms are very rare, and so you would have a sort of imbalance over terms, too, that could cause trouble. So <clears throat> to fix both of these issues, people use what are called TF-IDF features. So there's two parts to this. The first thing is called the term frequency. So we can think of this as a matrix whose i -th, row, and j -th column uh, stores the number of occurrences of term J in document I. So essentially that's like, you could think of that matrix essentially. That's this, this thing here. Um, at, at least the top, the top, sorry, the top would be that. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna normalize by the number of terms in document I. So that's sort of like saying we're going to take this and make sure that um, each column sums to one. Okay, so what that's going to do is it's going to make us invariant to document size. So we got rid of that problem. Now the other thing is um, uncommon terms are actually the ones that are the most interesting to us because those uncommon terms are probably going to, you know, tell us the most about a document. If, if a document only has a you know, particular terms that don't show up very often, that's a lot more informative than if it contains very, very often used words. So um, <clears throat> to quantify that, come up with the inverse document frequency. So let's look at this. So this is the number of documents with term J divided by the number of documents total. Okay, so if I have a term that is very infrequent, meaning it shows up in very few documents, then this number will be small, right? This is a number that will be much smaller than one. So when I take the log of a number much smaller than one, what happens? Large negative number, right? And then I negate it, so now I get a large positive number. So this thing is higher for uncommon terms and lower for common terms. So finally, what I do is I multiply these two things together to create my features, x, i, j. So just like always in, in our course, i is going to index the different data points, which in this case are documents. 
and J is now going across terms. <clears throat> and so these are going to be my features. That they're called TF IDF features. And so, you know, it has this term frequency, which we said is invariant to document size, but then you're multiplying it by something that is emphasizing the uncommonness of terms. And as you can see, it's pretty simple, but amazingly, it was used uh, by 83% of text recommender systems as of 2015. So very commonly used, even as simple as it is. <clears throat> A lot of papers or books you might read, you'll see that, that they transpose this, but we're writing it this way just to be consistent with the rest of our course. Okay, so basically the transposed version of this matrix X is often called the term document matrix. That makes sense because this is sort of document term. So when you transpose it, you get term document. Okay, so that's, that's basically how, those are the features we're gonna use now um, for our using that example. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this matrix. So, um, so in this matrix, xij is the score, the feature for document i and term j. Okay, so this, one way to use it in what's called document retrieval, where the goal is to find out which documents are most associated with a given term or terms, right? This is what you do when you go to Google and you type something in the search window. You type in a term, and you want it to tell you which documents you should look at that are related to that term. So if you have a term document matrix, this is, you know, you can come up with a very simple version of this. Given term J, you just extract the Jth column of your matrix, and now you get a vector, we'll call it DJ, a vector corresponding to term J, and you just look through there and you pick out the highest scores in this document vector, it's called, and the highest score tells you this is the document which is most related to that term. This is the one that's second most related, and so on. So you, now you just you have an ordered search of, of documents, or ordered list of documents. So it's like a very simple version of um, Google search. Any questions on, on that? OK, so another idea would be semantic analysis. What if you are trying to analyze a language, and you're trying to understand how one term relates to another term. Um, so if you, if you could do this, maybe you could figure out really the underlying meanings behind terms and not be so dependent on that particular language. So, um, so if you were given two terms, let's call them J and J prime, these are indices of terms in your dictionary, you could compute the inner product DJ times DJ prime. And so if you had terms that are really similar, when you compute this inner product, that would be large, meaning those terms are showing up you know, very often in most documents. Um, but if you had two terms that were not really related to each other, then this inner product would be smaller. So this is just one more thing you could do directly with your term document matrix if you wanted. Um, we're gonna use the term document matrix for, for clustering our documents. All right, any, any questions on anything so far? Okay. All right, so a few important uh, properties. Number one, this matrix can be huge. So because remember that it's um, in one direction, you have the total number of documents you're working with, but in the other direction, you have the total number of terms across all your documents. So even for our really simple um, example where we have like, uh, I think it was 3,300 um, different documents and each one is pretty short. We have like 40,000 different unique words, different terms. So even in that one, it's uh, pretty small. Uh, sorry, pre pretty large, pretty large number. Um, <clears throat> now, this matrix tends to be sparse, meaning sparse means most elements in the matrix are zero valued. And that's to say that, like coming back to here, you can see there's a lot of zeros. And that's because um, most terms are not used in every document. They're just showing up once in a while. Um, conversely, most documents don't have every word in your dictionary. They just have a small fraction. So you finally get a matrix that's quite sparse, mostly zero-valued. 
Sparsity is good um, for representation because um, <clears throat> basically if you represent this as a sparse matrix, then when you store it, what you do is you first build a list of all the indices that are non-zero, and then you only store the, the value for those indices. Whereas, you know, when you usually make a matrix in NumPy or MATLAB, it reserves space for a floating point or double floating point or whatever for every element, whether you're going to have a zero there or not. So sparse matrices are another uh, way that you can represent things. You can do this in, in Python. You can do this in, in MATLAB. It's just a different way of, of uh, storing a matrix. Now, when you have that sparse matrix and you want to do matrix multiply, it's more complicated because you have to first figure out, OK, which are the non-zero things that I'm going to be multiplying? And so it can, take, it can take longer. However, if the matrix is really sparse, then even those multiplications go faster because there's really not too many things to multiply. So, um, but um, sparsity is just kind of a fact about these particular matrices. So it's something to be aware of. And typically, they are stored as sparse matrices just because of memory reasons. <clears throat> Okay, so another property of these matrices is that they have low rank, um, meaning they have few non-zero eigenvalues. So when you do a singular value decomposition, you find that most of those, I should probably write uh, singular values here. Because if the matrix is non-square, you can't actually do an eigen decomposition. So here, we could always do a singular value decomposition. And what you notice is that there's only a few large singular values. Um, finally, another important thing is that all the entries are non-negative. You can never get negative counts. So, um, so that's another important thing that we can exploit for document clustering. Okay. okay, so this is how you do this in Python. You just import this um, TFIDF vectorizer. You instantiate it. You tell it which stop words to use, you know, the ones from the English language. And then we check your data set, and we just say vectorizer.fit, or fit and transform. And basically, it you know, comes up with our numerical features. And here we're printing out how many do we have, 3387. How many features, or how many terms, how many words, 38,000. <coughs> now that we have a numerical feature vector, it's easy to run k-means on this, you know, just like if we had um, numerical features. Okay, so let's see how this. Oh, well, let's let's take a closer look at some of our TF-IDF scores. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at a, an example document, and this is going to be the same document that we saw earlier. That was the post to the com computer graphics, where someone was looking help with it looking for help with a graphics card. And what we're going to do is um, we are <coughs> we're printing out for that particular post, um, this would be like one row in our X matrix. This is going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be a vector of numbers that are sparse. So because it's 40,000 long, I'm not going to print out the whole thing. We're actually going to sort it so that we have all the values from big to small. And I'm also showing you the terms that they correspond to. And those, you know, so like basically for this document, the term that seems to be most important is this POV. And that got a score of 0.42. Second one is hello. That got a score of 0.31. So again, these scores relate to how infrequently are these terms with, among your corpus. And so like this per particular person said, wrote hello in a weird way. You know, maybe he did it in this post only, or maybe he did another post. But somehow, you know, that, that is being treated as like a really significant word in terms of clustering these documents. Um, <clears throat> other ones like true, you know, that's, it was used here, but you can see it was probably used in a lot of documents, so it's not as important. And then all these ones, these were never used, so they, they have scores of zero. 
Yeah. So uh, the ones are banned, they're not used. How did you get that list? Um, so we, we started with like the row of the X vector, uh, ran sort on it. It's probably arg sort. So that gives us a list of indices. Okay, just a list of like numbers. It's some some permutation of one, two, three, four, actually zero, one, two, three, all the way to thirty-eight thousand. So we get a permutation. And then we just apply that permutation to our list of dictionary words. And that gives us this permutation. So when you do arg sort, once it basically once it sorts the non-zero terms, it doesn't even bother sorting the rest. So that's why these are all in alphabetical order or you know it yeah it's it there's there's nothing to sort here so it just leaves them in the original order yeah okay all right uh, any other questions okay so let's now run k-means so we can um, we can import k-means and mini batch k-means, which is like a faster version. Of, I don't think I'm using it here, but it's a faster version of k-means that can work on mini batches. Um, <clears throat> and so to instantiate k-means, number one, you have to tell it how many clusters. So this is an important, uh, you could say limitation, or it's just an important feature of k-means where you have to say how many clusters, you know, how many centroids for it to make. In practice, you might want, you know, you might say, well, I don't know. So there's different strategies to doing that. You could maybe try, you know, try two, three, four, and then use some other criteria to try to figure out like a model or selection problem. You know, how many do I need to use? Um, but, you know, here, since we have four categories, we just know that we're going to cluster into four different uh, centroids. Tell it the initialization. We're going to use k-means plus plus. How many iterations to run k-means? 100 at max. Um, how many times to run it from different random initializations? Just once. And verbose, print out you know, more stuff. And so this is what it prints out. It shows you, versus iteration, it shows you what I believe is going to be that uh, cost function. And you can see that it's decreasing. And at this point, uh, I think after iteration 13, it gave the same value twice in a row, basically like nothing changed. So that means nothing will change from that point on. So it terminated. Um, and let's see how it worked. So, okay, so let's think about, okay, what exactly is k-means giving us? K-means is returning centroids, right? What is a centroid? A centroid is a vector. In this case, a vector of TF-IDF scores because that's what our features that's the, the format of our features. So in particular, it's going to give us a 38777 length vector. And so that means that every, every entry in that vector corresponds to a particular term in our dictionary. <clears throat> so what we can do is we can go through our four clusters. And let's print out the top, uh, the, the largest TF-IDF scores for each cluster. And rather than showing you the numbers, we're actually just going to show you the term they correspond to. So cluster zero, found by k-means, was God was the most important, Jesus second, people third, and so on, in decreasing order. Cluster one, edu, writes, article, and so on. Cluster two, graphics, thanks, image, file. Cluster three, space, NASA, shuttle, launch. So when we look through these, we can definitely see some correspondence, right? Like this last one, space, NASA, shuttle, launch, orbit, moon, EDU, that really looks like it has a lot to do with science. So that seems like something worked there. This first one, we see God, Jesus, you know, morality, and so on. So that one seems like it's maybe about atheism or religion. Um, this one, I don't know. I don't really see anything happening in cluster one. And cluster two, okay, cluster two has graphics, image, file, program, format. So that one probably is to do with computer graphics. 
Okay, so we can see we have, um, seems like it's kind of working, but maybe we could be a little bit more quantitative um, in terms of analyzing things. So to do this, we can compute a confusion matrix, and it's a particular kind of confusion matrix. So it's going to be, we're going to make a matrix, which where this lth row and kth column is the fractional contribution of the true category L to cluster K. So this is what we get. And what I mean is when you look at every column, the numbers must add up to one. And so this is for column K. So this is for a particular cluster. This shows you how much of that cluster came from, um, sorry, how much of that, yeah. For cluster zero, well, maybe I'll write it up here. This is K equals zero, cluster zero. And then this is L is the true, the true category, the true news group. So 55% came from alt atheism. 45% uh, came from talk religion misc. And then, you know, very little came from the others. When we look at the next cluster, we see that it's really doesn't really seem to have much structure here. It's just kind of a pretty dense combination of all the different true categories. This next one, though, we see a high concentration, 94% of computer graphics. And the last one, 99% are coming from size space. So seems like it's, you know, these are doing a very good job. I mean, this, this one is, you could say it's not doing a, a perfect job, but we already kind of acknowledge that it might be almost impossible to split uh, alt-atheism from talk religion Yes, right? So, but then this one doesn't seem like it's this is some sort of failure. It's not really working. <clears throat> okay, any questions? Okay. Let's take a look at an error. So let's look at uh, cluster two. So this is most of your computer graphics, but we can see that there are, you know, errors that are, that are being made here. So let's look at the, an alt-atheism post I believe that's maybe one of these, alt-atheism in cluster two. So let's print it out. <clears throat> and um, it looks just like an email. And so, you know, this person is talking about philosophy um, and so on, but they're using an analogy which has to do with color, red, and they keep repeating these terms, color, red, red, red. And so, it makes sense that this was confused um, with the computer graphics because probably they talk about red, green, blue and stuff a lot there too. So, and maybe this is atypical of all the um, alt-atheism posts. So yeah, it makes sense why I categorize this as um, computer graphics. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so, um, Right, so basically we've, we learned about the, the problem of clustering, we learned about k-means, then we learned about document clustering, a, kind of a, a new application, and how to deal with the features, and we applied k-means to it. <clears throat> what we'll do next is talk about some very different methods to clustering. Um, one, which is called latent semantic analysis, is basically just PCA using PCA for this, and then the other is similar to PCA, but enforcing non-negativity. It's called non-negative matrix factorization. Okay, so, um, so basically, this is sort of just a high-level overview of, you know, how, how could you use PCA for this problem? How does that even make sense? So um, remember that PCA, essentially the first step in running PCA is to do this singular value decomposition. So this is sort of visually, graphically, what's going on. So we have a matrix X, which is our term document matrix. So as we go down this way, we go through our different documents. So we go through this way, we go through our different terms. And we said when you run a singular value decomposition, this is an economy one, where you have a square S. You have a first a singular vector matrix here, so all these columns are orthogonal. 
And then we have a, another uh, matrix here where all these rows are orthogonal. And then this is a diagonal matrix with non-negative entries on the diagonal. Okay, so that's what you get when you do SVD. And when you think about this, um, just, just looking at the dimensions, like here we have number of documents. That has to match this. So that means that this, this matrix here has to be like documents versus something. And over here, we have something that has to match this in dimension. So this matrix must be interpreted as like terms versus something. Now, you know, what, what is this something? This something is that's, you know, going across these rows and across these columns and down these diagonal elements. <clears throat> Perhaps that something is just the different topics within this corpus of documents. And, you know, here we're not, um, we're not telling it there's four. We're just saying, let's use PCA essentially to figure out, like, how, how this fits on a subspace. How does the data fit on a subspace? And actually, um, there's kind of, one way to think about it is, is running the SVD exactly. So that would be an equality. And then you'd have R be, sorry, R is the actual rank of the data itself. So what that means is if you, if you do this where, where this is the actual rank, that means you were able to find some subspace of dimension little r where all these things fit on, onto that subspace. Now in PCA we say, let's do an approximation where these are not exactly equal and we are gonna force this to be some number, sorry, these are some number that we want. So we could choose four. We could say let's come up with the best Essentially, you could say best rank for approximation of this matrix. So we do our economy SVD, then we would keep only R of these, R of these, and R of these. And we would say, do we see a correspondence? And we'll run this experiment. We'll see how well this works. Okay, so just the math, we saw this last Wednesday. But basically, this is how we can think about it. Um, now, non-negative matrix factorization is similar except that it exploits the fact that X is a non-negative matrix, which we have in this case. And it's, it's basically um, doing something very similar to PCA, but it comes up with a product of two matrices. It, it factorizes it this way, where again, both of these guys are positive or non-negative. So PCA doesn't know or care about non-negativity, but for this approach, it's fundamental. Um, and here again, um, you could, different ways to run it, but like here you might be saying, I'm gonna choose how many topics I wanna to advance, like four, and I'm gonna be looking for the four column times four row matrix that best matches this in mean squared error, or RSS. That's what non-negative matrix factorization is doing. But it's forcing these matrices to be positive. So that's the difference. Okay, so, um, so it's similar to what I just said, but with a little bit more details. So when, when people say latent semantic analysis, they basically mean let's ap apply PCA to a matrix to try to force it to do some sort of clustering. <clears throat> so as we said, PCA is based on this singular value decomposition, but another way we can write it is if we just write this in terms of, let's say the first column of U times the first entry in S times the first row of E transpose. That's one of these, and then we do it, the second column of U, the second element of S, the second row of V transpose, and so on. We could write this using a summation across all these different terms. It's just another way of writing this with the sum. And here, the number of terms that we need in the sum to have an equality is the rank of x. So when we run PCA, we tend to use not the rank, but we use some number capital R, which is much smaller than the rank. And now we get an approximation. Okay, so that's, 
that's essentially what we're doing. And in doing this, we're kind of implicitly choosing R as the number of topics that we're, we're trying to force in this, in this decomposition. Okay, and um, so if we want to talk about these terms in terms of the, the language of um, documents and terms, we could say that the columns in this matrix are the principal document vectors. Um, each one of them has the same, so each, each one of them is a vector where the number of entries is the number of documents. Or these guys we could call the principal term vectors. Each, each one of the rows there or each one of these vectors has a dimension equal to the number of terms. And then we have these S's which are some non-negative weights. So basically we're saying we can take this corpus, approximate, approximate it using R topics. When I look at the ith row of the U matrix, that's the relative contribution of document I to the R topics. When I look at the J row of the V matrix, that's the relative contribution of term J to the art different topics we have. <clears throat> okay, so this is just sort of an intuitive idea. It's not clear whether this really works or not. I mean, I guess it works to some extent because it has an official name and everything. So it's something that people do. Um, but there are some kind of weird things about it because when you run PCA, there's nothing that guarantees that the U and the V terms are gonna be non-negative. They could go negative. So that means that you have like negative contributions of documents and, or terms. So how do you interpret a negative contribution? So that's kind of an issue. <clears throat> okay, so let's see how this works. Let's just try it. So um, we do the same as before. We, we do, you know, we run SVD. We look at the different, um, let's see. So these, these are gonna be the, um, the Vs because the, the Vs here are associated with the number of terms. So for each V, we, can, we have a list of our different terms. And we sort the V elements from biggest to smallest and print out the different words that correspond to the most important V terms for principal component zero. And you can see what we get. Doesn't really seem to make very much sense. Okay, second principal component, <clears throat> um, Again, not seeing much structure. Third one, yeah, not seeing much structure in any of them. Let's check by computing this, um, this uh, the matrix that we computed earlier where each one of these rows is normalized to sum to one. And so this shows us for the first principal component, you know, what is the distribution across the true classes? And here we can see there's not really much clustering going on. We have all the different true classes represented almost equally. And this is true more or less for all these different clusters. So basically, this was a big failure. Um, it's just not working for clustering this data set. Um, so <clears throat> we, can, we can take this other approach, which is non-negative matrix factorization. And so here, it has a formulation that looks almost identical to PCA. So in PCA, we had uh, B and, what do you call it, Z, I think was the other one. So the only difference here is that we are requiring these matrices to be non-negative. And it turns out that there's no way you can come up with a closed form solution like we did in PCA, but you can design algorithms to approximately minimize this. Um, the advantage, so, so one thing is we know that the approximation error will be larger than with PCA because this is adding an extra constraint. So, you know, if, if I remove this constraint, which I do in PCA, then, then I can possibly make this smaller. And in fact, you can. By putting this constraint there, you're not actually able to get as good of a fit. But maybe what you get in terms of W and H will be more useful. They were completely useless as we just saw with PCA. Okay, so let's, we do this with our data set. 
And this is what we get. So for the non-negative matrix factor zero, we get things that look very good, very much like religious or atheism terms. The next one, things that look very much like what you'd expect from computer graphics. Next one, very good with respect to science. And then the next one, again, very good with respect to either um, atheism or religion. We can go through our cluster analysis. And so now our first one, you can see is almost completely dominated by alt-atheism and the religion one. The next one, 93% computer graphics, pretty good. The next one, 85% space. And the last one is again, almost a perfect split. Well, okay, not perfect, 93% of the data is either atheism or religion. So this is even better than um, what we got with k-means because k-means had that bad column, right? We now have no bad columns, they're all pretty good. Okay, so this actually seemed to work pretty well, this non-negative matrix factorization. And just uh, <clears throat> to explain a little bit about what's going on, um, it turns out this, this approach is really, has a very different way of putting things together to approximate the matrix. So we can interpret this as what's called a parts-based representation. Um, I'll tell you what, let, let's, let's hold off until the next lecture because I'm, I'm out, of town, uh, out of time and I could spend a little bit more time describing this next time because it's kind of a cool, cool idea. So uh, see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>